Are we ready? Do y'all feel ready? Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the second of our spring 2022 design lecture series. Um, we have, oh, David's here. <laughs> Perfect timing. Uh, we have folks here in house, and we also have our community online. Thanks to everybody who is here joining us. Um, these lecture series, it's, it's hosted uh, by the PNCA Design Undergraduate Program and Fisk Studio. I'm Chelsea Steven. I'm the assistant to the graphic design and illustration departments. I will be your other host today. So a little bit about the lecture series. Um, it got started in the fall of 2016 as a way to open our doors to a broad range of designers in the field. It has since evolved over various formats, adapting with the times. We streamed online panels during most of the pandemic. And while we're excited to be back in person, we've really felt that the streaming online has allowed us to broaden our, our reach to a lot of people who can't be on campus. So it's been a nice evolution to our series. Before turning it over to our guests today, I wanna give a special thanks to Rory up in our sound booth who makes streaming possible Thank you, Rory. Um, also want to thank Kristen Rogers Brown, who is a department head. She's attending virtually. Hi, Kristen, we miss you. Um, big thanks to Bijan and our friends at Fisk for their beautiful posters that they continue to make for this series and just their continuing support of our community. We're gonna hear from Daisy and Lucien of Studio Pangu first, and then we're gonna open it up for questions. To we're gonna open up to quest for questions to everybody, but to our online community, I'd like for you to subscribe. There's a subscribe button if you haven't done it in the past. That will allow you to enter our chat. This is a little protection that we use to keep those cyber bots from infiltrating our chat. So please subscribe. Before we start, a little bit about our guests. Studio Pangu is a collaborative design practice founded by Daisy Lee and Lucien Ung in 2016. Engaged in ongoing partnerships in the fields of art and commerce, their work is fueled by a multifaceted influence of Eastern and Western sensibilities. With a combined background in design, motion, fashion, and technology, their creative process is rooted in ideas first. Unbound by a singular discipline, they are obsessed with an interdisciplinary design approach that allows them to create contemporary and unconventional forms of expression with their collaborators. Daisy and Lucien write, the creative process is an intimate dialogue between, between one's identity, experiences, and ideas. There are no rules or limits. It is a utopian activity that allows us to connect dots and portray a world in a more interesting light. The projects we share will demonstrate the breadth of our interest and desire to defy the conventions of being a graphic designer. We are so excited to hear about these projects. So without further ado, here's Studio Pangu. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the amazing introduction. <laughs> It really uh, embarrassed us right there. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds way too nice. Um, okay. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. Um, thanks for coming to listen to us today. We, yeah. we know it's pretty late, and probably some of you are pretty tired, so we totally understand if you doze off or have trouble staying awake. We'll try our best to be enter as entertaining as possible. First off, we would like to introduce ourselves and to give you a glimpse a bit of, of our backgrounds. Um, start with me. Hi, everyone. My name is Daisy Dahe Lee. Um, I'm originally from South Korea, the country famous for BTS, kimchi, and hanbok. I came to the US 11 years ago and to study a graphic design in the School of Visual Art in New York. From there, I studied graphic design and motion graphics. And after I graduated, I started as a motion designer at Gretel and MTV. And as I, as I became more interested in branding, I shifted to Pentagram. Working directly with Michael Beirut let me have full creative freedom with his generous trust and support. 
And it led me to become an uh, independent designer, focusing more on building my own typeface and fashion design and expanding my creativity to broader mediums. And my name is Lucien. Um, I'm originally from Singapore, the country famous for being super clean, um, crazy rich Asians, and also amazing food. Uh, I came to the U.S. 10 years ago to study at School of Visual Arts in New York. Um, I, I originally started out in advertising in Singapore and eventually uh, interned here at Wyden Kennedy Garage in Portland um, with Dave, actually. And then because of my because of my background in advertising, I've always been obsessed with the ideas behind the work. And eventually, I switched back to graphic design to do branding and art direction. Um, Freelance at Sengmeister Walsh, Pentagram, Under Armour, and now um, been taking a more still life photography on the side. So. Daisy and I, we both met in SVA in New York. And we are Studio Pangu. Pangu. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is we came up with our studio name here in Portland. Um, we were walking alongside Northwest 23rd Street, Daisy holding salt and straw in her hand. And then we were brainstorming studio names for ourselves. Um, we were dreaming of living in Portland, working at a nine to five job and doing art projects after work on the side. Um, we came up with a ton of humorous names like hardworking Asians, generic graphics, um, client pleasures. Uh, but the one that stuck obviously is uh, Studio Pangu. But Daisy, what is Studio Pangu? Pangu means furt in Korean. We came up with this name because it represented the way we wanted to work. Also, it became very memorable when we explained it. Our studio's motto is just pangu. As we mentioned, pangu means furt in Korean. It defines what we do in our studio. We have three points. First, don't take things too seriously and not worrying about what is possible or impossible, and just pangu to see what happens. And as you know, you cannot overthink when it comes to furting. Second, the furt is the output of our digestion. Just like our work is created through the interpretation of our experiences, culture, and knowledge. And third, you become very vulnerable and critical when it comes to furt. You are fairly generous with your own furt, AKA your own creations, but you become very critical of others. It is a general tendency that we have witnessed throughout our experiences, and all we're trying to do is keep that in mind and have a laugh about it. Our work is feared by a multifaceted influence of Eastern and Western sensibilities. Growing up in Asia and coming to the US has influenced our work in a way that we've never imagined. And today, we're gonna introduce you three projects that explains what that means. The first project, um, we put this project in because it was very meaningful to us and also because of uh, it shows off the connection between Portland and us. Um, the first project, End of Summer, is a cross-cultural art program in Portland uh, comprised of an annual summer residency for emerging Japanese artists as well as a series of public lectures and presentations. The program seeks to build a dialogue between Pacific Northwest and Japan through contemporary art. The residency utilizes the setting of Portland with its cultural ties to Japan, community-oriented ethos, and, the, and dynamic art activ activities as a site for creative exploration that nurtures an international connectivity. Uh, long story short, basically what that means is in the month of August, uh, every year during the summer, Japanese artists come to Portland and then they, they go around visiting different art studios and interacting with the locals. And then um, through that, they come up with their own opinions and ideas. And at the end of it, they have a open studio for, and all the locals come and have a dialogue with them. Um, because 
it is called end of summer and then it's Japan. So we use this circle symbol, which is uh, also a symbol of Japan's sun. And the sunset denotes the sense of time coming to an end, much like how the end of summer is marked by a sunset. And the second layer of interpretation of the circle can also be seen as a bubble or mouth. As we converse and engage in critical dialogues as a group, the bubble slowly starts to disappear, allowing us to be part of the community. So, end of summer, natsu no owari. So we replace the O in off in both Japanese and English with a perfect circle or the sun, as we like to call it. And since end of summer is a month long residency, we created the time-based identity for it, dividing the sunset motif into five periods and each period represent a week of the program. And since this is a cross-cultural program between Japan and Portland, it was very important to us that we create a bilingual identity and we took that motif and applied it to everywhere, from business cards, to envelopes and letterhead, and tote bags and pins and etc. As many of these artists have not been to Portland, so we wanted to capture the essence of Portland summertime in our identity. So each year we will create a new set of promotional material. And this is the one from 2018, which is our favorite. Uh, these were the sunset gradient that were blurred from the actual film image that we took in Portland. And we made them into affordable poster. And on the back of the poster, it contains the information of the program, both in Japanese and English. And these were distributed in Japan for people to apply. Once the program started, we also extended the language to Instagram to promote the guest lecture series and open studio events that End of Summer hosted in August. And End of Summer has been a very special project to us since then, as it brought us to Portland and helped us to discover the direction in our life. And since then, we've been keep coming back to Portland every year because it also became a very special place to us. Um, so the next project we want to share is Play Play La. It is a project about reimagining Singapore's most iconic playground. We were invited by our friends Social Species, a uh, design and publishing studio, to create a zine for their booth at the Printed Matter Art Book Fair, Virtual Art Book Fair, alongside several other artists. We were asked to create a zine that interprets play from our culture. And after, because we are both from separate countries, Korea and Singapore, we basically had to duke it out and see who won, and I won. We decided to pick Singapore, a multicultural city island state and a driving economic center for the Asian region. In a short span of 65 years, Singapore transformed itself from a third world country into a symbol of progress and prosperity for the neighboring region. And as you can see, 20, 2015 and 1974 is pretty different. And now in 2022 is even more different. So that's how fast the, the city transforms. But in the pursuit of progress and due to the lack of land, much of its heritage has been demolished and replaced with skyscrapers and fancy buildings. As we were discussing the games we used to play amongst ourselves, we found out that there were a lot of similarities with games we played. So we had to we had to kind of figure out which was the most interesting we wanted to portray. But the and there was one that stood out the most and that was these dragon playgrounds. Built in nineteen seventy, the Dragon Playground is one of the most famous playgrounds in Singapore. These uh, playgrounds were designed locally to instill a sense of national identity because in 1965, Singapore became independent from uh, its British ruling. But then um, 
a lot of them right now have been demolished and replaced with like these international playgrounds that are like safe and plasticky but cheap to produce. So what we want to do was to highlight these Jap uh, dragon playgrounds uh, as these playgrounds were simple in function but rich in imagination. Mostly, most of these playgrounds only consisted of a slide or swing and a rocking horse, but we went, but as kids, we mostly went there to meet new friends, play made up games like catching and stuff. And we played around with the structure of the playground instead of actually playing with the playground itself. Um, kids went there to be imaginative. And so we wanted to create something that encapsulated that nostalgia, but also the essence of play. We came up with several ideas of how to bring that to life, like a pop-up book, a board game, or uh, painted wooden blocks. But these felt limiting as they weren't able to capture the freedom and imagination of a playground. Like we didn't want someone to build the block and then just leave it on the shelf and not touch it again, or like a book that just sits on the shelf as well. So we spent a few days uh, experimenting and making cardboard prototypes, and we eventually found a form that satisfied us. Um, so we decided to make a modular dragon toy, and basically we wanted people to be able to create anything they want and to be creative. And because of that, Daisy and I had so many iterations and she had a sore thumb. And after several rounds of trial and error, we landed on these set of wooden pieces. We created the iconic dragon head. And then we also created a bunch of other parts from like the body, scales, uh, joints, ears, and ladders, and humans little human characters, if you can see on the top. And then from that, we were able to make um, this skinny dragon, this little baby dragon that resembles the original playground the most, and with like these little humans climbing on top of them. Um, and then a stegosaurus, stegoceratops, a muscular dragon. And then this one, we like to call a corgi dragon. Because of its short legs <laughs> and the gigantic paws. <laughs> and then uh, a gorilla dragon, and then a uh, long dragon, and then a twin dragon. Uh, this one we call longxia in Chinese, but then uh, it looks like a shrimp to us. And Shenlong, which is means God Dragon. Uh, I thought this one looked like the dragon in Dragon Ball Z. That's why we call it Shenlong. And after creating and photographing all the different forms, that was not the end, because we still had a zine to design. And just placing the images of our new toy did not sit right with us. And as a graphic designers, we wanted to reinterpret our concept in an editorial format through a graphic design perspective. And FYI, Singlish is Singapore's colloquial English. It is a mix of English, Malay, Mandarin, Tamil, and other local dialects all jumbled up together. So we decided to create a custom modular typeface with these wooden toys. And just like the way we built our dragon playground. And here is the full character set. And because of its modularity, we were able to make more alternate letters to keep the sense of creative freedom in our zine. And with our revitalized modular dragon playground and the, the custom modular typeface, we create a zine called Play Play La. For your information, La is used to change a verb into a command or to soften its tone in Singlish. Like an example? Uh, no la. <laughs> Sorry. Eat la. <laughs> and we start the zine with the background history of the dragon playground. 
And we pepper the zine with the different dragons people can create, as well as the nostalgic sayings and games from the past. And throughout the zine, the contents are written in Singlish, which have intentional grammar mistakes. Just like what you can see over here, like what this. Um, and Singapore is a very uh, multiracial country. The games they played in the playground and sayings are all very multilingual. Like uh, Oi Api Asum is this game that we play as uh, we use to decide teams. It's basically black and white. You flip your hands and see who goes to what team. Mm -hmm. Also, we added a graphic element on the edge of the zine and picture containers to hint at the wooden joints. And here are the spreads of our zine, which includes variations of our modular dragon playground, sayings and games and history written in typeface called Ginger and Monostan mixed with our custom modular typeface. We were very overwhelmed by the response from everyone who had supported us and bought our zine. And people all around the world, from the US, Europe, like Korea, even like Taiwan and Singapore were interested in our zine and more importantly, our fading culture heritage, the, icon, the iconic dragon playground. And that was actually our ultimate goal of this project. So hopefully we can keep preserving our own culture by revitalizing them. And lastly, we printed out lots of postcards and spray painted uh, people's initials on the back of the postcard to thank for supporting us. And the last project, which we call Tang in Korean and Chinese, is an ongoing project that we are very excited to share today. In the winter of 2019, um, Daisy and I traveled to Korea and Singapore to visit each other's home countries, as we both have never been there before. Um, previously, before that, we didn't leave the US for like four years. So going back was nice. Our countries could not have been more different. It was freezing cold in Korea and blazing hot in Singapore. It was one of the hardest trips we had to pack for. And after coming back from Korea, um, I created this poster as an abstract interpretation of my experience and what I felt in Korea. The poster captures the vivid energy of Seoul and the exhilaration I felt as I walked through the streets and alleys of the cultural mecca of Asia. The um, letter in the middle is called Tang, which means pawn in English. For us, it refers to the cultural exchange between Korea and Singapore. Um, in the poster, you can see like these on the top left, those golden little ovals which look like coins are also kind of a reference to the Korean rice cakes and then uh, the colors just being very neon that because Korea's night scene is like bustling and stuff. And then on to Daisy. And when Lucien finished making his poster, he shared it with me and explained the meaning of the element just like what he did and also his perspective. And that inspired me about the similarity, uh, that inspired me to think about the similarity and difference uh, from what I felt about Singapore when I traveled. And Singapore and Korea both, once a colonized and a third world country, transformed into uh, thriving economies in a very short amount of time. But in the pursuit of progress, heritage and culture often got neglected and also got replaced with Western things or things that are new and better. So based on the similarities and differences between the cultures of these two countries, this is the Singapore version that I created. Known for its street food and vibrant night scene, Singapore is a melting pot of culture and cuisines. And then the Chinese character in the middle is Tang, which means pawn or to match it in English. And here are the posters side by side to have a clear view of the similarity and differences between these two cultures. And 
we combined this design to represent a more general Asian society. After combining these two illustrations, we decided to create another form that encapsulates the similarities in Asian society based on our own perspective, specifically between Korea and Singapore. So growing up in Asia, um, that's, that's me over there. We've, we've always had strict rules and certain expectations from society. In Asia, uniforms are prevalent throughout society from school to military. I'm also in one of the pictures, the military uniform there. And Daisy on this top left, um, to working environments as well. We were sort of indoctrinated to live and think the same and to not stand out or to be different from the crowds. Um, it was always kind of frowned upon when you stood out too much. But that was us growing up. So I'm sure these days it's slightly different, a bit more open now. But so the societal pressure one faces oftentimes lead to suppress identities and desires and also many unrealized dreams. So we decided to create a, a uniform with our illustration that represents the general Asian society through our perspective. We started sketching, we started our sketch that looks a bit like a plain office worker shirt. It looks very normal and basic on the outside, but then um, when it's all buttoned up, you can't really see the inner layer that we created underneath with our illustrations at all. And this is our interpretation of society trying to repress everyone's identities. So the, for the inner layer, we printed the artwork on a shiny satin fabric, which emphasized the luster of our own identity. And we constructed shirts in two layers. Um, as I mentioned, the inner one is a shiny illustration satin fabric and the black matte cotton fabric on the outside. And the wheel, we built the shirts in the two layers that can be fully closed with one set of buttons and also be stylized in four different ways. And as we mentioned, when it's all buttoned up, you cannot see the inner layers, but also, oh, but also, once you move the shirts, the shirts start looking very different. And here's the rendered animations of how the shirt and sleeves can look differently based on the movement and exterior influences, such as wind, temperature, emotions, and etc. And it represented the truth that even though we try very hard to hide the beauty of our own identity, it is impossible to hide it. After several rounds of iterations, we create this shirt. And we also wanted to document this project in a conceptual way and also present the ideas of the shirts. And here's our friend, Willie, becoming a very professional <laughs> and cool model. <laughs> Thanks, Willie. Yeah, he looks like an essence model, so we picked him. Um, so we went out into we just drove out to this open field and shot this. And our photography art direction actually references the Truman Show's fake sky setting. It represents our pursuit of breaking out of the shell that society has created for us and to truly be ourselves. So referencing the fake blue sky of the set design, we color corrected all the sky imagery in our images to pushed it into this fake blue color. And also, we shot this on a very windy day so that the inner layers get revealed very naturally when, when the models move. And we tried to capture the body movements uh, to be more extended and expressive, almost like they're breaking free or trying to reach for something. And we also darkened and cropped out faces to suppress the model's identity as, uh, once again, going back to the concept of how society tries to repress us. And, but then, eventually, you'll still see the, our inner identities, which is like the shirt, because the, all you see right now is the, the how colorful the inner layer is. 
this has been a very exciting journey for us as we're both pretty new to fashion or photography. Uh, every step of the way has been a learning process. Uh, it couldn't be more aligned to our studio model, which is? Just Pango. And that is everything uh, that we have for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, oh, and lastly, we'd like to thank Bijan, Christine, uh, Chelsea, and the PNCA faculty, and everyone who has joined us physically and virtually. Uh, we're going to open it up to Q&A, so I'm going to pass the mic around to our folks who are here, and then I'll also be reading some of the questions that come through on our streaming side. So questions to come. Anyone have a question? Hi. Um, I just want to say I love your first two projects a lot. They're so cool. Um, but I was really uh, wondering, how do you uh, manage when a project has like uh, bilingual or multilingual like audience or like multicultural? How do you like manage and like um, design around that? I, um, I guess for us, depending well, d when we're dealing with Korean and Chinese, has been hasn't been an issue because. I, I speak Mandarin as my second language, and Daisy speaks Korean. The the for the first project where it's mostly Japanese, we had uh, our friend who's probably watching this right now, uh, the director of End of Summer. He he could he helped us proofread stuff, and then also uh, we had a friend who was Japanese help us uh, check through any kernings and and making sure the translation and what we're writing, everything felt right. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Awesome. Hi, guys. <coughs> guys working on next? Do you guys got any secret projects on the horizon that you're excited about or anything maybe that you're not working on but you're interested in doing? Uh, well, actually, uh, the last project that we shared called Tang, which we actually got a lot of inspirations when Bijan actually visited our studio last time and then he was suggesting, oh, like, maybe he don't remember, he doesn't remember, but he was <laughs> like, maybe you guys should make a lookbook, you know, it looks cool. Um, so that's actually we are working on it right now, but we wanted to make it a little bit more like a digital versions of it, uh, and we hopefully we can that um, thinking of uh, expanding the projects to bring in more collaborators, so that whoever has a similar background, uh, culture background like us, uh, coming from the Asian culture, um, and also feel the same type of. Uh, struggles or repressions uh, from their um, last times when they're in Asia. Uh, so hopefully that could work well and then we can share with you guys soon too. Yeah. Stay tuned. Um, my question is, I'm curious what level of uh, the kind of skills in the second and third project you learned in school versus postgrad, and like uh, what level of things if you did learn in school that you've been maintaining? Because I'm just curious if like these different skills that you have are used in your day job as well, or if it's just like a side passion. Um, I, I can go first. Um, well, I went to school for advertising and graphic design, so. I think those two things lend itself very easily. I guess the other part was trying to build that dragon, was us basically figuring it out ourselves, just taking cardboard and cutting stuff up and building it. We, we don't have any 3D skills to prototype it in the computer, so we had to do everything manually and like the old school way, just trial and error. Um, I guess similar for photographing stuff, like how we shot the dragons to 
we basically spent three days messing around with lights to get the right setting, and then uh, that's how we photographed them. I mean, there's a lot of references out there these days we can access to a lot of good photographers like as a if, uh, as a references and inspirations. And sometimes we're trying to figure out how are we going to um, make that type of lighting. So we're just trying and errors, just like what Lucien says. And also, I think for the, the Dragon Playground itself, also we found a lot of references from like uh, Pinterest or like somewhere that you wouldn't expect that where you can get the inspirations and then literally like really we just like try and errors until the full bag of the trash can was like uh, three full bag of trash cans um, and then after that I think we sort of figure out uh, once a while and I think that also applies to the Tang project too so I actually never uh, studied like fashion design before, but there are lots of references or lots of tutorials in the YouTube and then I start watching it. It's more like the way that we work. We just have the ideas and then we're like, let's just try it and let's just try to figure out. And these days I think the internet was the main places that we can get all the information. So, so we're like trying to watch the YouTube videos and then just try it and then figure out on the way. And that's actually has been what we are doing. Um, for back to Bijan's questions, I guess recently I took a condensed type program at Cooper at Type, and that is actually totally different learning than <laughs> what I did on this uh, modular typeface. I'm sure like my teachers are like, Daisy, that's not right. But I think that's also like a fun part of it because sometimes you really need to get out of the rules and then see what actually happened. And then because, and then also that's because of the, the whole different concepts of the idea itself. So I guess that's what have been very helpful. I guess the other thing that sticks with you in school is once you learn the, once you have a strong foundation in design principles, you, that really applies to whatever you do. Whether you try to explore 3D or, or you want to build a sculpture or, um, you're designing a typeface, as long as you have that strong sense of what the principles are of hierarchy and all that basic stuff, that really applies to everything, I guess. We have a question from our online community. Um, do you have any advice for partners who work together? Communication. you should trust each other the most because uh, because our backgrounds are very different. Sometimes we, uh, we oftentimes, let's be honest, like most of the times we always like, we argue a lot over the decisions that we make, but that's actually a very, very fun part of our collaborations because it ended up to something that I've never, imagine that I could. So like a playground also like, I wouldn't, like if Lucien didn't force me to be like, oh, let's build some modular typeface. Don't worry about all this like logic or the actual typeface, um, the, the textbook lessons. And I wouldn't be landed to build those type of full set um, of the characters, the modular typeface. And I think it has been like this. We always have very, a lot of push and pull moments. And then that only been built because we trust each other. Like we not trust each other in, I mean, of course we trust each other's like talent and the capabilities, but more likely we trusted the whole process will bring us to something that we would never be able to imagine. So that's the advice. Great answer. <laughs> I have another one from online. What are your favorite things in your studio? Like things, things? I guess things. A Noguchi lamp. What is that? A Noguchi lamp. Oh, is it like your office? I don't know. I, I guess for me is the dragon playground that 
has been built and we often like get bored and uh, like stuck and uh, working on the commercial projects and then we are like oh that was a fun time and then we just go and then just build it by ourselves and also like we said it really we can create endless stuff it can be just like dragon playground without dragon's head too so it's just um i enjoyed the whole like the joy of yeah playing with the toy so that's my favorite things in our studio well i have a follow-up question to that then because um i was thinking about this earlier and i think kristen asked you this in the, in the friday fives um how do you get unstuck you mentioned when you're feeling stuck sometimes you play with the dragon but i'd love to hear the ways in which you get unstuck when you feel uncreative. Mm -hmm. I think we, for us, because we live in uh, San Francisco and a lot of people only think like San Francisco is full of tech companies only, but it actually has a lot of beautiful hiking uh, trails and it's a really nice weather too. So we often go on a hike and also even we don't have to go to hike, there's a lot of hills in the city and we just walk around and sometimes we're just walking and then just start talking about the project and sometimes it actually gives us like really nice ideas or like helped us to unstuck or even not like that, it just, uh, we just keep climbing up and then we, turn around and they see the whole view behind us and it helps me to understand that oh even though we're like stuck in our process of whatever we're doing we eventually gonna make it so it gives us the energy and encouragement to keep going so i guess that's the way that we actually unstuck ourselves on the other side of the yeah. the dragon playground <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I don't know. We we go eat good food. That kind of helps us. <laughs> and um, digestion. Dig yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> moving moving helps us a lot. Like we we go on jogs or uh, sometimes we watch this Thai boxing thing at home to really get <laughs> our brain going. Uh, or usually. I think that's pretty much it. We there isn't like a one way to get unstuck for us and we know that everyone has a different process and for us it is these simple things like being able to do simple things in life that helps us get unstuck, I would say. Yeah. Um along the digestion line. <laughs> I love your your saying the just pangu. It's really funny and actually it's perfect. Um, but do you have a story or an experience that would help encourage young designers to kind of take certain risks? Uh, do you have a, a story where you took a risk that you were scared of and it actually worked out or worked out in a way you didn't imagine it would? Um, yeah, uh, I think that was the also the Portland time that we came for the first time. I came to the first time. So when we uh, thinking about the Studio Pangu, that was the time, as I mentioned, I started out as a motion designer and I was working at like a Gretel and MTV, working on like Viceland and some like cool projects. I learned a lot and I really enjoyed um, being a motion designer, but it didn't make me really satisfied uh, what I really wanted to do and then after, after a while, I realized that it because I wanted to be a brand designer, I wanted to working on more branding stuff, but because of my portfolio is all full of motion design, I would not be able to find a job that I really wanted it. But I found out that actually Pentagram Microberry's teams were looking for an internship. And then it was already a year after I started working as a just like normal uh, motion designers and you know often <laughs> oftentimes a lot of people has start having uh, enough big egos once you graduated and then you're probably thinking of oh i want to be a midway designer instead of like junior designer but everyone's going higher i had to like took my ego on the side and then decided to take the internship and because the most important thing is that i just really want to learn it and then i thought it was very 
life-changing experience and life-changing opportunity. And that time I doubt about it a little bit. And but Lucien actually forced me to do it. Like he was like, "You should do it. You want it. Like you know you want it." And then I'm like, "Okay." I'm like crying, but I applied the job. I didn't even know that I would get it. But it turns out really changed my life. Like working with Michael. I'm gonna cry. Uh, working with Michael um, really gives me a lot of creative freedom. He really trusts all his designers with full of support and full of like heart uh, and trust. And after that, I learned like literally everything. Whatever I can create over here is like I learn everything from him. Even the way that you speak with your client, even the way you speak with people, communicate with people in the cocktail party like he even teaches you like what to watch like what news that you need to know um, as well as all these graphic design principles and etc and that was like the biggest risk that I took but also like the most worthy um, experiences in my career so far so if anyone who's doubting or like needs to put a s ego on the side please go for it because i can say that it's worth it and you know you want it it's mm. a great answer Would I keep going? Um, can i give you that just so, so um, they can hear it? sure all right here we go um so a lot of your projects have um they're like strategic they have like a conceptual component to them or like a story they're not just based purely in like aesthetics. So how, how, what advice could you give to a young designer in terms of like structuring a project or, or, or building it? You know, like they're, they're like project projects they're not just like a one-off type of thing. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about that process and about like how you organize and, and, and build a project maybe. Uh, to be honest, I'm really bad at organizing things, but <laughs> I'll, I'll try. Um, for us, I guess in general, we try to avoid anything that lacks uh, idea that we're excited by. So then that allows us to build off and expand, expand it into a, a larger thing. So, I mean, sometimes we do just do one off, like I'll just make a fun poster or whatever. But then uh, oftentimes once we start talking, we just make it into a much bigger thing uh, than we need to. Um, in terms of structuring it, I'll let the person who's better at organizing things reply <laughs> to you. Can you rephrase your question, Dave? Sh sure, sure, sure. So, like, um, the there, there's like layers to the project. Mm -hmm. Like, they're they. They either have like a backstory, or or they they have like a source material, or whatever. I th I think like when you're in school, a lot of those things are provided for you. But now that you're on your own, you're the ones that are are directing those things and, and gathering those things. So like, w what what tips do you have for somebody in sort of like sourcing that material or thinking about it so that it's not just one thing, but it's a thing of multiple things coming together, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lucien can answer to the question better. Um, <laughs> we, I guess, from from on my end, I would just I usually write everything out in in my notebook, almost like a, a mind map type of thing. So th things are sort of connected. So like you say, as you want to go from this idea to the other idea, we try to we try to write that down and and think that through. Um, how you go about sourcing those things? We usually just Google or we ask friends. We asking friends actually is a great resource. They a lot of times people have very different interests and they know a lot of things that you don't. Um, so we do that. And in terms of how we present it, um, usually when we look at portfolios. I know the student way is to put everything up front, like, uh, oh, this is the idea, and like this is how I got here, step by step. But uh, in terms of a portfolio-wise, um, what 
is ideal is you open with something more impactful and then uh, go into breaking it down and simplifying it into uh, points that are easier to remember. Um, oftentimes, we don't put every single thought we have into the uh, thought or idea into the presentation, and those are left to one-on-one -on -one conversations. We don't, we don't try to overload people with all our ideas and thoughts because we, we think that um, once you do that, um, there's a possibility of people not listening to you at all. Or yeah. We will um, get rid of all these nice anticipations too. Um, so trying to keep the excitement keep going until we actually reveal the whole thing. Um, so yeah. I don't know if that answers you. Your question sounds great. Thank you. I have a question from online, our online community. What would you? What would be your advice for creatives seeking to gain creative opportunities? Um, reach out to as many people as you can. Apply to as many places. Um, don't o expect an uh, email back because this is usually the case, but you still have to send it and then hope for the best. And uh, the best thing you can do is to figure out if you, ha if you know anyone there, and that usually gets you an in, uh, uh, at least an interview or something, an uh, email reply back. Um, your friends are your, your best resource, I would say. You're all the connections you have. And then instructors? Uh, instructors? I mean, PNCA has amazing instructors already. Uh, I would suggest to build a really nice con connections with everyone else, um, build a good relationship with everyone else, and just keep expressing the what kind of work opportunity that you're looking for to those people so that these people can remember you when, they're, when they hear about the so many opportunities. And that's like the best way. And that's actually how we build our career after we graduated too. I, I guess, yeah, to Daisy's point, um, always putting your work out there and then whether it's commercial or personal, putting it out there and sh letting people know that you're interested in doing that type of work, um, eventually that sort of work will come to you. Um, with for us, we're still working our way through trying to do what we want, so we're also doing that. Like We want to um, possibly do more fashion stuff, so we start projects on our own and eventually hopefully get those type of projects. Um, yeah, that's how we, we try to approach it. Great, thank you. Any other questions from our on-campus crowd? I do have another one from online. Um, what strategies do you take to attract clients? So it's kind of similar. Yeah, I guess it's If you want to ex ex extrapolate on what you just said. Um, a lot of our clients come through in-person meetings, actually, like people we meet. Um, oftentimes, if we meet someone new, we would always actually tell them about our work. And that's uh, how a lot of the projects have come by, uh, through friends and through people we know. Uh, end of summer is through our friend who I'm w I met here in Portland. Um, and then when we went back to New York, we met up with him and then talked to him about us wanting to do more sort of uh, branding related work. And then that sort of came about. Um, same thing with Play Play La too, is also a friend we know through, through work actually. And then she herself is starting, was starting her own studio and then doing, she knew we were interested in doing more culturally uh, fun projects. So that's how we were drafted in as well. Um, in general, a lot of times we we get our projects to friends and then uh, we try to use social media to promote us even though we're pretty bad at it, but we still try to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then our like uh, previous client uh, recommended us to the new client, which is, we actually appreciate a lot because that means like they enjoy the relationship like the friends sometimes, like, yeah, they're like fond of us in terms of um, our personalities. But then I think the professional world and the more business side, I think uh, that is like a good um, 
approval from the clients that we are a good business relationship or business partner, so which we really appreciate a lot. Um, but yeah, most of the projects coming from the friends or our previous clients uh, and their like uh, colleagues and etc. Uh, to continue of Daisy's point, the best way to continuously get clients is to always be prepared, have your portfolio ready, reply your emails on time, and then um, that's pretty much it, I would say. That's pretty good advice. Do we have any other questions? Uh, I will ask one final question, because it's a good one from your Friday Fives. Um, what feels vital to the future of design to you? For us, um, as we wrote down in the interview, we feel like um, there's so many designers these days working for big tech companies or um, corporate jobs and stuff. We feel, and then as we move, everyone um, gets more and more wealthy, and then we move into this like more simplified international style of design. We feel like the future for designers and creatives are them expressing their individual selves more and that mm -hmm. makes the work much more valuable as you are able to um, have an individual voice. Um, this my p our POV. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? All right, I think that is gonna close it out. Um, I'll just come up here and think do one final thank you. Thanks to Bijan and Fisk, our, our lovely friends at Fisk. Thanks to Kristen Rogers Brown, who couldn't be here, but she's here virtually. And uh, thank you, as always, to Rory up in our sound booth. This wouldn't happen without him. He was amazing. So, and more than anything, thank you, Daisy and Lucian, for being here, sharing your experience, your expertise. Your talk was fantastic. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last thing is we have a couple of zines over there for anyone who would like to have one from the second project. Feel free to grab one.